Thank you, Nancy. And now to the Joe Meek story. It's narrated by Jess Conrad. It's been produced by John Pickford and Tom Ryan. When the mists are rising and the rain is falling and the wind is blowing, holding up tried to compete with the Giants was Joe Meek, songwriter and creator of the hit record Telstar, one of the biggest pop sellers of all time. Joe Meek, the maverick pioneer of pop, he was Britain's first truly independent record producer. Now Joe Meek's life will be revealed from every angle, his family. I don't think I ever met anybody that just had that Wow. His musicians. To me, he was like an absolute genius, a magician to do that. I thought it sounded so different. That's what my reaction to it was. It sounded so different. You know, he was the pioneer of it. So, you know, they've got to thank Joe for that. His friends. Joe had a very good side to him, a good, very good, kind nature, a lovable person. Underneath it, the exterior, he was a really nice guy. And his fans. It's like an eerie, ghostly sound with lots of echo, out of this world, ethereal. This is the story of the legendary Joe Meek. Well, I try and start at the beginning and then bring you right up to date with my present activities, making pop records for the commercial market. Robert George Meek was born in 1929 in Newant, a quiet market town in the Forest of Dean. Nicknamed Joe as an infant, he developed an interest in sound recording at an early age. Joe's niece, Sandra Meek Williams, remembers stories of his childhood. He burnt his hands as a child. The army had come and they burnt some bars or something out, outside and, and he'd gone out and he didn't know that they were still hot. It burnt his hands so badly they thought that he'd never be able to use his hands again. My granddad, Joe's dad, went and put his hands straight in milk and they bathed his hands in milk every day. And then my granddad bought him a crystal set. And that's where the fascination from that, I think, started. He just had this mischievous look about him all the time, as though he's sort of, you know, thinking about what he could get up to. He just loved going around taping people and, and bugging the house, which was his biggest thing. He would rig the house up and then nobody ever found out where he put the bugs or how he actually taped them. You know, the conversations that had been going on would suddenly come out of nowhere. And of course, sometimes, you know, they weren't very nice conversations. <laughs> and we, they never find out how he did it. Meek historian, Jim Blake. But he was a very quiet, shy lad. He was the odd man out in his little village down in Newant, and uh, he developed a passion for sound recording, for anything technical. He wasn't sporty, and, and he got picked on at school for being a sissy and all that sort of thing. And uh, he had this uh, flair going right back for anything technical. When I was seven years old, I used to try and experiment with my gramophone, and I discovered if you play the record at the end, the run out groove, you could shout down the sound chamber and the sound would be imprinted in the grooves. And I thought that I'd discovered something marvelous. And of course, I was really doing just what uh, Edison had discovered years before. And he'd always have a tape recorder in his pocket and he'd go, do you want to say anything? And as soon as he said that, you knew very well not to, because you knew, and you'd say, no, I don't want to say anything, and sort of fiddling around, oh, all right then. He'd also uh, done a homemade recording quite earlier on of his sister singing, and uh, she was horrified when he played it back to her. Nan would say something about somebody, and then he'd tape it back when they came in, just to get them into trouble and that kind of thing. So he did have quite a mischievous mind where he liked to get people into trouble. Throughout his teens, Joe continued to experiment with sound, building his own electronic equipment. Later, he joined the RAF as a radar technician. Jim Blake believes this is where Joe's fascination with the extraterrestrial began. 
he was stuck out at this lonely airbase. And um, I can well imagine that's probably where his interest, or if you like, obsession with, with outer space came about. And um, obviously this, that's something that stayed with him throughout his life. And of course, in the period he was there doing national service between about 47 and 1950 time, that was precisely the time when flying saucers first became uh, all the rage. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he'd actually seen something as a radar blip and I, I feel sure that that's where that interest came from. When I came out, uh, in the meantime my father had died, I decided that I must take the plunge and move to London and take a job uh, connected with recording. Joe quickly became recognised as the best recording engineer in the business. Again, Jim Blake. As a result of his uh, the good reputation he got as someone making sound effects and so on. That's how he became involved in record engineering and soon became very much in demand. The record company producers realised that Joe Meek's unique style would give them an ear-catching sound. Bad Painted Blues by Humphrey Littleton, where he mic'd it up in such a way that the lead piano, I think it was, got distorted and uh, Humph hated it. But it was, it was a big hit and it was the first true jazz record to make the top 20. Midnight, one more night without sleeping. So me would fiddle around with the knobs on the desks and everything and uh, get this slightly different sound. Things like Frankie Vaughan's Green Door. There's an old piano and they're playing hot behind the green door. And Shelton's Lay Down Your Arms. Come to the station, jump on the train, march at the double down. He would say they were his productions, whereas, of course, they were really the <laughs> company's productions he was working for. But most of them, you can tell he's on them. There's that extra depth of echo and the padded drums and so on that, he, that were his trademark, really. In 1960, Joe recorded one of his most imaginative sonic experiments. I Hear a New World was a space-age fantasy and pioneering adventure in stereo sound. I hear a new world. was released on Joe's own label, Triumph. That was the first real independent pop record label in this country and um, it was only because Angela Jones by Michael Cox. There was too big a demand for it for this little tin pot company to press them in time and the whole thing ended in tears because uh, nobody could get hold of the record and uh, the, the label folded a few months later. Angela Jones, you know I love you darling. Inspired by the success of Angela Jones, Joe Meek decided to take on the music business establishment. Building a studio in his flat on London's busy Holloway Road, he invented a groundbreaking method of pop record production that would revolutionize the industry. Chart-topping success was just around the corner. made his mark as the country's most in-demand recording engineer, Joe Meek was now able to produce pop records from his home-built studio. John Layton remembers his first session. I was quite nervous and I, I anyway, I sung into this mic and, and then Joe played it back and uh, it was really quite amazing what I heard back because I couldn't really believe it was me. I thought, God, is that really me? And uh, the various sort of uh, reverb and whatever he did, the, you know, the magic of Joe Meek, if you like. Well, let's put it this way. I was quite impressed with what I heard. Joe's setup was worlds apart from the plush surroundings of the established London studios. 
I thought this can't be for real. It was just a mess. The whole place was a complete shambles. There was, there were cables and boxes, and the actual studio, if you want to call it a studio, it really was a room. Uh, it was overlooking the, the Holloway Road, and it was also there were blankets and goodness knows what hanging over the windows to keep the sound of the traffic out. It, it was just a total and utter shambles up there. Wild wind. Although apparently shambolic, Joe Meek had created an environment where he could record in his own individual style. Tornado's drummer Clem Cattini and the outlaw's Chaz Hodges describe inside 304 Holloway Road. It was just a front room. There was this old piano on the left-hand side as you walked in, which Joe put these tacks on the hammers so it used to sound like a jangle piano. The control room was like the converted kitchen, and there was just knee-deep in tape on the floor, just discarded tape. Most of the time I sat in the fireplace on a kit of drums. And, of course, Joe used different rooms. I mean, he used his toilet to record in as well as an echo chamber. The strings, if any strings were needed, they'd come in and, and sit in the uh, bedroom playing strings and he'd have sort of girl singers in the bathroom. But uh, he knew what he was up to and he, and he got those sounds that he wanted. Joe's own brand of musical alchemy was an eye-opener for the young Chaz Hodges. I remember when we recorded, the Outlaws recorded Swinging Low, each of us had a, an instrumental break. I remember saying to Joe at the end, I said, isn't it a shame we can't get all the best breaks in one take? The best bass break was in like take three, the best run break was in like take five, the best electric guitar break in take six. He said, don't worry, he said, that'll be done. And I thought, who's he kidding? Anyway, we came back a few days later and played it. What he'd done, he'd cut the pieces of tape and edited all the best ones into the, the one take. To me, he was like an absolute genius, a magician to do that. In 1961, Joe Meek teamed up with Jeff Goddard, a songwriter who would establish a close working relationship with Joe. Their first collaboration became one of the most imaginative pop records of the era. John Layton. I remember Joe saying that it's time for another death disc. So that was Jeff Goddard's brief, go away and write a song for this young actor. And as I understand it, Jeff Goddard went home that weekend and Friday night he sat at the piano and nothing came and then he sat at the piano all day Saturday and tinkered around with it trying to think of lyrics and trying to work out melodies. And he went to bed on Saturday night and according to Jeff, he got up on Sunday morning and he'd had some sort of a dream. And he sat down and he wrote Johnny Remember Me on a Sunday morning in 20 minutes. The first time I heard Johnny Remember Me was Jeff Goddard singing it at the piano. It all sounded a bit too heavy for me and sort of, I thought, well, I prefer the more simple type of melody and, and lyric. But so I wasn't that impressed with it. When the mists are rising and the rain is falling and the wind is blowing cold across the moor. I hear the voice of my darling, the girl I love and lost a year ago. When I went in the studio and recorded it, and then, you know, what with Charles Blackwell's arrangement and all the uh, heavenly voices and the lovely ethereal sort of uh, feel to it. And it had a tremendous beat to it too, a ro really sort of thumping beat. I mean, it really rocked along. And once I heard that and heard it then played back, I thought, yeah, this isn't half bad. It's actually uh, quite unique. This, in fact, I've really never heard anything like this before. Yes, I'll always remember I was just totally spellbound by whatever he was doing. He would always stand up at, at his desk and he'd, he'd thump his right foot on the, on the ground and, and with, along with the beat or the rhythm of the song. And he'd, he'd just fling himself into all these various sort of knobs and switches that he had there. When he wouldn't do anything gently, he'd sort of throw himself into it and yank something round and yank something else round and all sorts of noises and various things would come out of the speakers and I think, God, what is this man doing? The song reached a huge audience when it was featured in one of the most popular television programs of the day, Harper's West One. I was offered a role 
of playing a pop star that goes along to the store and opens up the record department. He said to the director of this particular episode, as John is playing this role of Johnny Sincere, wouldn't it be a good idea that Johnny Sincere sings his latest recording? And they thought it was a wonderful idea. So I imagine that anybody that had television on, on that Thursday night in August 1961, the majority of the country would have been watching Harper's West One. The song would prove to be a huge hit, but for Joe Meek and Jeff Goddard, this was no surprise. Oh, well, apparently Joe and Jeff Goddard knew it was going to go to number one because they'd had a seance and been in touch with Buddy Holly, and Buddy Holly told them it would go to number one. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Both men were obsessed with Buddy Holly. They believed that his spirit was a guiding influence. Meek historian Jim Blake. They really believed Buddy Holly's spirit was in the studio and um, Jeff's inspiration. They woke up one morning with the idea that this song had come to him from Buddy's spirit and it was Johnny Remember Me and then shortly after that he did the tribute to Buddy Holly by Mike Berry. Buddy Holly was killed in a plane crash in 1959. His songs will always be remembered. Always. Joe and Jeff's other worldly interests caused much amusement for the musicians who overheard their conversations. Chaz Hodges. It was quite a comical sort of relationship, really, how they used to talk to each other. I mean, Jeff Goddard was, uh, he, he would turn up and say, Hey, Joe, I was talking to a cow this morning and it knew what I was saying. Skyman, Skyman. Johnny Remember Me was the most popular record of the summer of 1961, but not everybody appreciated its appeal. The singer, John Layton. Nobody had ever heard anything like it before, and I don't think really the critics were, <laughs> were quite ready for this extraordinary Joe Meek sound. It was described in various musical papers as it sounds as if John Layton is singing at the bottom of an empty well. With Johnny Remember Me at number one, Joe Meek became Britain's first independent record producer to top the charts. His next major achievement would place him firmly on the world stage. Following the success of Johnny Remember Me, Joe Meek formed a new group to back his artists in the studio, naming them The Tornadoes, drummer Clem Catini. We backed John Layton, we did uh, Wild Wind, we did Mike Berry, we did Don Charles, and a lot of other stuff as his uh, studio backing band. The Tornadoes recorded hundreds of sessions in Joe's tiny homemade studio, witnessing his unique and uncompromising methods. Working with Joe, I mean, he was a sound genius because, I mean, the sounds that he got out, the equipment he had was, it was unbelievable. You know, you can't explain to people. If people could see the equipment, and he wouldn't believe that he could get those sounds out of it. But he wanted to have total control himself of the way he recorded and what he recorded. He broke so many rules. I mean, you know, you couldn't have so much bass from one end and you couldn't have this because it would blow up the transmitters. But he broke all those rules and he did it the way he wanted to do it. During this period, Joe was making some great records.
early summer of 1962, Joe Meek woke up during a thunderstorm with a tune in his head. He immediately rushed downstairs to the studio to make one of his infamous demo tapes. Chaz Hodges and Clem Cattini remember them well. What he would do, he would have an idea for a song, then he would find a record, a pop record, as long as it was the right tempo, regardless of tune, then he would sing his song over that song and then give it to me, and I would have to try and decipher what he was singing and work the chords out. You could be, you could be good. You said you love me, you really should, cause you, you, you I'm a baby doll. The thing that Joe gave us, I mean, he was just singing over the top of a backing track, which had nothing at all to do with the chords and the, the structure of Telstar. <laughs> Given Joe's fascination with outer space, it was no surprise that he should dedicate his new tune to the first transatlantic communication satellite, Telstar. It'll be the familiar scene at the Cape. All systems go for a historic advance in communications. Project Telstar. We sat down and worked on it. You know, we worked on what we were going to play rhythm-wise, we worked out what we were going to do. It was like to get something that was moving along. That's why the rhythm is the way it is. There's that sort of in the middle of it where the guitar bit is all those sort of like harp sounds, which is in actual fact is Roger playing this tack piano. <laughs> And sort of obviously to go into a key change which makes it sound even more as if it's moving in space. When he sent me the finished article, I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, I mean, what he'd done. We were doing this summer season with Billy Fury down in Yarmouth and funny enough, I was in the loo and I got a knock on the door and said, Alan, have you seen this? And put this paper under the door and it, it was the charts. And Telstar got in at number 10. And by the end of the week, it had gone to number one. Not only was Telstar the biggest selling record of 1962 in the UK, it became the first record by a British group to top the charts in America. As an instrumental group, the Tornadoes had no obvious frontman, but Joe singled out the handsome young bass player, Heinz Burt. He said, I know a bass player. He said, the band came up from Southampton. He said, I wasn't mad on the band. He said, but the, the bass player was OK. I said, what's he like? He said, oh, he's tall. He's quite good looking. I said, no, what does he play like? Is he any good? Oh, yeah, yeah, he's good. Anyway, he got him down. It turned out to be Heinz. Joe would say, oh, you've got, oh, you've got a photo shoot tomorrow. You've got a photo shoot there. We've got to do this. You've got to do that. And, and I said, what do you want? What shall we wear? He said, well, make sure you'll wear the white shirts and whatever it is. And we'd get there and Heinz would be in a striped shirt. But I suddenly realised, well, hang on a minute. Every single photograph, you look at that era... Hines is dressed differently than we are. And, of course, Joe had made him dye his hair blonde. Now that Hines was a minor celebrity, Joe became determined to make him a star, regardless of his shortcomings as a singer. Again, Chaz Hodges and Clem Cattini. He would fall in love with these artists and he would make a record with them, or could buy crook. I mean, Hines was a prime example. I think Joe should have sussed out what Hines was like immediately. I did. I mean, I knew straight away. He was just interested in being a, a star, full stop, and that's not very attractive in anybody in my book. I suddenly worked out that we were a vehicle for Hines's career. Joe or Hines must have thought we were a bit thick because the thing is, suddenly Hines turns up in a brand new Ford Zephyr. He suddenly he's got a yacht in the bay somewhere. If it was down in, on the seaside. You know, I th they must have thought we were stupid. I thought, I knew by then Joe Meek was in love with him. Whenever you're sad, whenever you're blue, whenever your troubles are heavy, beneath the stars you play your guitars, you 
just like Eddie. In the end, we were relieved in a way when Hines left because we've got a bass player in, you know. He, I mean, he couldn't play, you know. He wasn't a bass player, you know. He couldn't. He wasn't a musician at all. Bless him. I mean, I think he made a couple of good records. Joe Meek's love for Heinz was no secret, and although he lived in Joe's flat for three years, Heinz always insisted that the relationship was strictly professional. Speaking in a BBC Arena documentary in 1991, Heinz recalled the situation. It was an infatuation. I think so. And I think that was the thing with him. Where well, I told him to get off, I wasn't into that sort of thing. If there's something you can't have, you want it even more. Just Like Eddie was Heinz's only significant hit. With the Beatles' Mersey Beach style dominating the airwaves, Joe Meek's futuristic sound was out of date. During this period, Joe was finding it increasingly difficult to get his records into the charts. Chaz Hodges. After the Beatles and, the, and then the Liverpool sound came in in general with uh, all the lot of them, Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J. Kramer, which was all of the same sound, uh, the Joe Meek sound was straight out the window. Disaster struck in November 1963 when Joe was arrested and charged with importuning for immoral purposes. Meek historian Jim Blake and Clem Cattini. The place in question, Madras Place, was as dreadful little uh, standing room only so to speak gents that was open all night and it was notorious and of course he claimed he was set up i felt sorry for him in a way i mean he was stupid to do what he did and i think he was honestly i think he was set up anyway because funny enough the guy that uh, nicked him was the guy that he was trying to importune but that, that was his downfall because everybody started blackmailing him on the one hand after that and on the other hand you can noticeably see a, a decline in the amount of his record releases with dwindling chart success joe's behavior was becoming more and more erratic Believing that his studio was bugged, his naturally suspicious nature was developing into paranoia. We were upstairs in the studio, the phone rang and Joe said, go and answer the phone. So I'll go downstairs. And uh, I picked the phone up and this man says, could I speak to John Meek, please? You know, I said, uh, certainly, who's, who's calling? He said, uh, would you tell him it's uh, Phil Spector? So I shouted up, Joe, I said, Joe, Phil Spector on the phone. He rushed down and he picked up the phone and he went off alarming about how Phil Spector had nicked all his sounds, he'd pitched all his ideas, he was a thief, and just smashed the phone down and broke the phone. You know, he had this paranoia about everybody was nicking his ideas. Speaking in 1964, Joe Meek revealed the problems he encountered within the music business. Again, I met with a lot of difficulties because I kept coming up with hits and uh, the A&R men and different people tied to these major companies were inclined to be a little bit envious and I have to watch these people like a hawk. However, during this period, Joe was making some great records, including Glenda Collins. I lost my heart out of the background to the boy on the swing machine. Such. The river, and the river. There's a man walks the streets of London late at night. The river, and the river. With a little black bag that's oh so tight. The river, and the river. 
He's got a big black cloak hanging down his back. Well, that's a one bit cat that just a hate to fight. The Ripper! Yeah, the Ripper! Well, they walk down the street, ever get him, it says your name, the Blouser. And who can ever forget Hurt Me, recorded by yours truly, Jess Conrad. Until we both are even, and you forget about leaving her. Just want your love now. Please love me now. I swear I'll be true and I'll never hurt you again. By 1964, new groups such as the Rolling Stones were pushing teen idols like Heinz out of the pop scene. Instrumental groups like the Tornadoes were also suffering. Clem Cattini recalls the problem of following up the international success of Telstar. The opening bit of Globetrotter was Venus in Blue Jeans. You know, they started getting press saying, oh, we're Tornadoes in Blue Jeans and all this business. <laughs> I just didn't like it, and that was it. Whoa, World War Four started, you know, it's like, get out of my studio, go, I don't want to see your face again. I'm walking down the stairs, and this tape recorder follows me down. To this day, I think uh, Ride in the Wind, which George Bellamy wrote, should have been the follow-up, because it was uh, much more akin to Telstar. <laughs> Joe's temper tantrums were earning him a bad reputation. Recording sessions were often disrupted by his violent outbursts. Joe made a lot of enemies in the business, especially in the recording industry, because of the way he went about things. If you dared to criticise anything he did, I mean, he threw a stool at me once, and I managed to duck in time, and it hit the brand new tape recorder rather than me. As Joe became more difficult to work with, he found the industry doors closing on him. All the respect, I think, that he'd had previously was, was gradually draining away from people, you know. They'd sort of lost their respect for him because of his... He wouldn't sort of bend on his ideas, you know. And I think this is sort of sums it up the way the people thought of him at that time. Have I the right to hold you? You know I've always told you that we must never... Joe's last major chart success was in the summer of 1964 with Have I the Right by the Honeycombs. The group gained extra publicity with their female drummer, Honey Lantry. Honey, is this the first record you've made? Yes, it is the first. It must be exhausting work playing those drums. Not really, no. What's it like being surrounded by four men then? Oh, they're all right. I look after them. You know, I do their hair for them, make their tea. Joe took advantage of the novelty value by adding some extra percussive accompaniment. That was Joe stamping on the stairs with microphones clipped underneath him. Have I the Right was Joe Meek's third and final chart topper. It signalled the end of the relationship with his lol songwriting partner when Jeff Goddard claimed that the song had not been written by the Honeycombs managers. Meek historian Jim Blake. Allegedly, they came up with this song, Have I the Right? But then when Jeff heard it, he said, Joe and I wrote that, we called it Give Me the Chance. But Jeff was adamant that he had written that, not that he'd written it himself, but that he'd written it with Joe. And... He took Joe to court over it, because Joe refused to admit to what Jeff alleged. Poor Jeff was completely ripped to pieces in court. And that was the end of Jeff Goddard. Come right back, right back where you belong. Oh, yes, you belong. Oh, yes, you belong. 
Around this time, Joe would often visit churchyards, hoping to catch sounds from beyond the grave. Joe's friend, Tony Grinham. We used to go on uh, ghost investigations, things, things like that. We had this cat come across us, and, uh, you know, cats sound very much like human voices on with their wailing. Uh, but this cat seemed to say hello, and Joe was knocked out by it, you know. And um, we took the tape back to the studio about four o'clock in the morning. He was blowing through his speakers. He, he wanted to do um, an LP uh, with ghostly sounds on it and uh, with, with orchestral backing. But he, he liked uh, weird occult stuff. Throughout 1965 and 66, Joe struggled to achieve any chart success at all. Despite this, Joe was making some great records. Something I've got to tell you, baby. family travelled from their Gloucestershire home to visit him over the Christmas period of 1966. His niece Sandra was only 13 at the time. The last Christmas I was taken up in 1966 in December and Cleric drove and took Nan and Uncle Joe back up and I was allowed to go with them. And he showed me all around the flat and I can see it now. I couldn't believe the, all the, the cables that were in his room. I mean, you literally, you couldn't walk in the room for the cables. And he just said, oh, go and walk over them. And he was so proud to show me around. And before I left, he put three tape recorders on the table in his office. And he let me choose one. And I've still got that today. I was going to go back up in the summer and spend my summer holidays up there. But sadly, that didn't happen. As the year drew to a close, Joe could only hope that 1967 would bring renewed success. But at the beginning of February, those hopes 
was shattered. You know I always love you, darling. Please stay. Joe Meek's reputation within the pop world was at an all-time low. His records were not selling, and his finances were in a complete mess. He took some time out over Christmas to ease the pressure. His studio assistant, Patrick Pink. Joe's mother had come down to London from London to spend some time with him, and we'd actually gone to a party at the landlady's house in Finchley. You know, we had a really good Christmas. We had a good party. Everybody was happy. And Joe was very happy. Uh, and if you were a fly on the wall and looked in on us at Christmas of 66, you wouldn't know that the events of 67 were about to happen. Although Joe was worried that the lease to his flat might not be renewed, he always had a very good relationship with his landlady, Mrs. Shenton. Mrs. Shenton was like a mother to Joe. She was like a school teacher type lady that kept herself to herself. She was a very prim and proper lady, very nice nice person. You know, she used to look after him. Uh, she would pop in occasionally, make sure everything was good. Um, and I never ever heard money ever get mentioned between them, ever. By the start of 1967, nearly all of Joe's recordings were being rejected by the major record companies. One glimmer of hope was an offer to join the production staff at EMI's Abbey Road Studios. But as Joe was no team player, he couldn't bear the thought of losing complete control. The Tornado's drummer, Clem Cattini. He wanted to see the record that he made from beginning to end. Basically, he went against all the rules of recording. He wanted to make sure that it was done the way he wanted it. At the beginning of February 1967, Joe Meek's world was falling apart. His golden boy, Hines, had left him, and with no money coming in, he was worried that he would lose his studio. With his paranoid delusions out of control, Joe Meek's demons were catching up on him. On February the 2nd, Joe was recording with his studio assistant, Patrick Pink. Joe had decided, with Hines out of the way, uh, there was an X amount of tracks that needed to be voiced over, and I, I started work on them that afternoon and that evening. He started coming out and shouting at me, they listening to me through the wall, and he started writing down notes, saying, mime to your own song, just mime, just mime. I ended up miming to my own song for about mm, one hour or so in the evening before I said, I've had enough, Joe. Joe carried on working. When I woke early in the morning, I could still hear the tapes rolling upstairs. I chatted upstairs, Joe, come and get your breakfast, come and get your toast and coffee. He sat down with me, he ate one slice of toast, drank some of the coffee, wrote a note saying they're still listening to me. And I said to Joe, do you want me to call the doctor? And I took my life in my hands actually saying that because, you know, uh, and, uh, and he shouted, no, I don't need no doctor. By now, Joe's mental health was in a very poor state. He handed Patrick one final note. It said, I'm going now. Goodbye. Well, Joe was up in the studio. Tapes were playing loud. And he put his head over the bass and shouted, tell Mrs. Shenton to come up and see me. About five minutes later, Mrs. Shenton came up. She came over to me just outside the office. And she, she said, is he in a bad mood again? I said, yeah, be careful. She said, oh, okay, I'll come up and sort it out. Don't worry, you'll be all right. And with that, she went up the stairs. I went back into the office, sat down at the desk, and all of a sudden, I've rushed to my feet, literally as I've gone out into the corridor, Mrs. Shenton's tumbling down the stairs. I literally caught her in my arms, and she's landed on the floor with me. As she did, she, she sort of turned over, and I could see that there was damage to her back with loads of smoke coming out. My first reaction was to shout to Joe, who was watching from the landing upstairs, she's dead. And he looked at me stony-faced, with a gun in his hand, 
and I tried to make my way up the stairs to Joe, but I never made it that far. I only made it about halfway up the stairs of that when Joe had reloaded and took his, his own head off. By the time I'd actually sort of looked over the top of the banister, I could see the obvious. Joe had killed himself. It was Friday, I came home from school. My mum had got a fruit shop and she was there. I said, Mum, are you all right? And she said, no, she said, we've heard that Uncle Joe's not very well. And I said, oh, when I write to him and thank him from the diary, I'll put in there, I hope you feel better. And of course, she, she just went a funny colour and she didn't say anything. Then I went back through the shop into the sitting room and my nan was sat there with my Uncle Arthur and I heard my mum say, we haven't been told by anybody, it's not trip. So Sandra, go and look after the shop. So, of course, I just went in the shop and stood there uh, to serve people and there was a policeman came through the door. My mum's face, it just drained. Uh, he went out the back and they told mum and nan and Arthur what had happened and um, Nan, Nan passed out on the table and Arthur just sat there and that was it. They'd been told that he died. The first two policemen I walked in actually joked about it. The first one sort of looked at uh, the bodies and said, come and have a look and see what a shotgun can do. You know, and they were joking about it, you know. I mean, from my perspective, you know, you don't need that, do you, you know. And they were looking at me and telling me to stay where I was, stay there, son, stay there. Uh, and then the detectives arrived about two minutes later and one came in and started asking me what happened, who were they, etc., etc. I was arrested in the first place and taken down for my own safety. When they took me out, there was 50, 60 people out there shouting, uh, murderer, murderer, you know, and they knew nothing had what gone on inside. It affected me really, really bad. I mean, it, it literally t took me years to recover from it. It took me the first, initially two years, just to get over what had happened. And my nerves were on end for, for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, literally, I was a different person for, for quite a long time. He may have been OK at home, and I'm talking as a 13-year-old. I'm not talking as somebody, you know, as old as I am now. I've got the wisdom. It was always exciting. Uncle Joe's coming home, Uncle Joe's coming home. He'd always come home with beautiful presents, and everybody was excited, you know, that he was coming because we, we knew Don Molly would be coming down with presents like you've never seen before, but, of course, loads of new records. When he came down, he had a diary with him, and I kept on. I want a diary like that. I want a diary like that. And about two weeks before he died... He sent me this diary down and in the front it said, all good girls get what they want with love from your Uncle Joe and put his birthday date on the 5th of April. I was only a young girl and I don't, I don't know. I can't work out how somebody could go from that state in such a short space of time. Joe Meek died on the 8th anniversary of the death of his idol Buddy Holly. Meek historian Jim Blake. I was very much into Buddy Holly's music at the time, as I knew Joe and Jeff were, in fact. For that day, uh, there was an LP going to come out. There was I walking up Holloway Road to collect my uh, Buddy Holly LP, which a couple of friends were coming round to hear in the evening. And just before I got to, on the opposite corner, there was a news agents, and I saw on the placards for the early editions of the evening papers, the words, pop producer dies in double shooting. And I knew straight away it was him. It had to be Joe because of the anniversary. By this time it was midday and um, there was a crowd of people outside the studio and I was, I was really shocked and I, I just got collected my LP, came home and put Telstar on over and over again. Of course then these friends came round and when I opened the door one of them was holding up the front page of the Evening News and as he opened it Telstar blared for. <laughs> That night, Jim Blake and his friends formed the basis of an appreciation society dedicated to Joe, which exists to this day. 
Many future stars had their first recording sessions with Joe Meek, including Rod Stewart, Mark Bolam, David Bowie, and Tom Jones. published in 1989 and a film about Joe Meek's life, due for release in the spring of 2009, has kept his name alive. But it's his music and his sound that still inspires. Porter's head producer, Jeff Barrow. His music and his production is, is still a massive ongoing influence to so many modern bands. I mean, you know, um, we were doing things like ripping paper, you know, uh, having... We would listen to his records and kind of think, well, how can we emulate that? And it would be like, they've got all the technology, you know, I mean, bands nowadays have got so much, but it literally gets down to someone in front of a microphone ripping paper and having, you know, four different sets of scissors. It still comes down to physical experimentation, you know. And because it's so easy to experiment with, you know, a computer format now, uh, within music and technology, people are actually looking back to people like Joe Meek and realising that that was experimentation and that's how you sound like yourself rather than sounding like an off-the-shelf programme that a computer gives you. The Tornado's drummer, Clem Cattini. He'd come in into the studio and he'd tell everybody off and then he'd disappear and you could hear him in the control room giggling, you know. He had a funny, weird sense of humour as well sometimes but he had this, this quirk, you know. The genius of Joe was the fact is the equipment. I mean, God, the equipment that he did it on, you know, was, was incredible. I mean... You'd go in the control room and you were lucky coming out alive because there were so many wires and everywhere. It was lucky he never got electrocuted. There was the thing there and somebody kicked. He said, don't kick that, that's my echo. And he'd made his own echo with a spring, you know. Things like this, you know. It was, it, that's where the genius of Joe was. The Outlaws, Chaz Hodges. The bass sound, in those days I'd done a, a couple of recording sessions and the uh, electric bass was a pretty new instrument and nobody really knew how to record it. But Joe Meek, he used to direct inject the bass so there was no amplifier in the studio, so the bass notes wouldn't spill onto anybody else's microphones. And the sound he got was close and clear and precise and just so up front. And that was the basic of the sound, was the bass and the, and the closeness of the uh, drums. He liked presence, whereas in, in those days before that, everything was sort of like, I mean, drums, they would use one mic or possibly two, one on the bass drum, but Joe would have like four or five mics just on the drums. Singer of Johnny Remember Me, John Layton. I think he was trying to do too much with the equipment that he had. I think he was way, way ahead of his time, Joe Meek. I, I goodness knows what he'd be doing today with all the technical know-how. And I think he was probably becoming quite frustrated because he wanted to get different sounds but he just didn't have the equipment to do it with. Meek historian Jim Blake. To me, it just conjures up what life was like in, well, not just London, but in this country generally, late 50s, early 60s, and all this thing about flying saucers and everything, because so much of Joe's instrumental tunes were either outer space or Wild West. It's like an eerie, ghostly sound with lots of echo, out of this world, ethereal, and the speeding as well, I like that. And a lot of Joe's stuff, notably Riding the Wind and also Telstar itself, and John, I remember me, have a similar rhythm. His studio assistant, Patrick Pink. When things were running smoothly, the tapes were running, uh, you had a good band in, you'd have a fantastic day, you know, uh, a real fantastic session, and it would be extremely happy. And even after the session was over, uh, the atmosphere was still there. <laughs> Joe's niece, Sandra Meek Williams. It was strange growing up because at the time I didn't realise what it was all about. Was your, you're 13, so what do you know at 13? I know this sounds strange, but he had an awful lot of um, patience with us children. He wouldn't let anybody tell us off at all. 
He had so much patience with us. It was incredible because, you know, when I've heard about his tempers and his tantrums, but he would just sit for ages with us, you know, what, whatever. He just loved being around. He just loved... I think it was the fact that he came home, he liked the peace, he liked the quiet, he was with his family, he could be himself. And then, of course, you know, as you get older and you think about things and then there was a real gap where obviously Joe's music wasn't being played and, you know, by then I'd, I'd grown up and I'd, I'd married and got family of my own and I used to sit and play the acetates and think, why didn't his, you know, why why didn't his records get into the charts and because you'd listen to them and... And I think, well, I don't understand it. And then people, you know, started to recognise that there was all this music out there that nobody's ever been able to do anything like it, not even with the technology that's around today. There's something about Joe's record, even if it's on the radio, it's like you've got speakers coming out of the walls. But nobody's ever created his music nobody's ever got anywhere close to it there's something magical about his music joe meek was the godfather of modern pop music production he pioneered many recording techniques and his maverick approach paved the way for the beatles and all who followed 